And then I got woken up about two in the morning and they said, my, my exec woke me up and said, we got to talk, we got a problem. I said, what? And he said, the Rolling Stone article came out. And I said, really, that's, that's going to be a puff piece. I mean, he's still around the command group. He says, it's not. All right, so I went downstairs and uh, I lived right above our operations center. And he shows me the article. And, and as soon as I read the article, I knew what, what was happening here. The, the title of the article was a runaway general, you know, which you start with that. And then the article basically paints my command team as a, as a um, sort of out of control group, uh, attributes to us a bunch of comments about leaders and whatnot, that sort of thing, the vice president and whatnot. And as soon as I read it, I said, all right, this is gonna cause a conflagration because we live in that world right now. We live in, look what General Shinseki's going through right now. Uh, what happens is we, we rush to the conflagration faster than we can investigate the reality of it. And so this was a pretty tense political time and I knew there was this perception of civil military issue. So this thing, uh, this article came out and as soon as I read it, I said, all right, well, it's gonna be impossible to deal with this in a, in a way where I can go now, let me investigate it, let me figure out what's true and what isn't true. And I didn't know. Didn't know what in the article was accurate and what not. I knew that the overall depiction was not correct because I knew my team, but I didn't know on the facts. So I, I made a couple of calls. I called the Secretary of Defense, the chairman obviously, and, uh, but I sort of knew what the deal was. So I went out run and I came back and I actually thought a couple of times I said, I'm asleep, this is a dream and I'm gonna wake up. Because my whole life I thought I might be fired for incompetence or I might be killed. Those were, those were pretty realistic possibilities that I thought a lot about, but I never thought I'd be accused of disloyalty. Never in a million years. And so when this thing comes, it was an out-of-body experience. But so the morning comes, and that, that was, you know, it got to be daylight in the morning, and we're starting to, to deal with things, and uh, I got a call from the chairman, says, okay, we're going to want you to fly back to the states later today and meet with the Secretary of Defense, the President, it's okay, fine. And as I did that whole process, I was able to think about it. Now, it, it was blowing up in the press over here, I couldn't see that, but I, I had a sense of that. There really two real options there. One is to say, no, I don't think it's true. I think we've got to fight this. I want my day in court, but you got a war to fight. You got 150,000 guys, you got to follow you. And you think about what's that situation then? And then the other option is to say, all right, um, whether or not I think the article's correct, what I have done is allowed myself to be in a position that puts a president in a tough position. And that's not my, I'm not supposed to do that. Whether I think it's fair or not, it's certainly not fair for the president to suddenly find himself pressured by this. So I made the decision that I would go in and, and tell the president that I would uh, stay if he wanted me to or offer my resignation if he wanted that, which is exactly what I did. And I never really had a second thought. I mean, obviously I've thought about it. I've replayed this in my mind a million times since then, but I don't have any doubts that what I did in terms of offering my resignation was right because the most important thing at that time was a mission. And what you didn't need was a controversy between a general and the president being on the front page and, and that sort of thing. And, you know, the hardest part of it, and if I don't know if any of you all have ever been there, everybody says, well, you know, I'd like publicity. Maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't, <laughs> uh, is because particularly if you think it's not fair. There's really not a venue to say that. It's just, it, it, that's not an option. And you got my 85-year-old father reading this, got my, my son off at college reading this, got my wife reading this. All, that's what you think about. You think about that and you say, look what I've just positioned that, that you are in now that, that I feel responsible for. So, you know, that's the way it works. How do I feel about it now? Um, kind of like I got hit by lightning. Um, I, I sort of feel like you know, it's just one of those things that happens. It comes around and you know a number of things line up and poof, this thing happens to you and you really can't stop it. 
and you can't cry about it, there's no point in it. You, you decide you're gonna move forward. And so from that day on in your life, you can either replay that forever, you can argue that forever, you can try to say that wasn't right, or you can live moving forward and say what I'm gonna do is conduct myself so that everybody who meets me says, wait a minute, I read that story and I met this guy and they are not congruent. And then let each person make their choice. And that's what I do.